So we're going to build this or extend this to work in 3D space as well. However, for that, I want to decrease my volume resolution again because this is going to be slow. So really coarse volume here. And instead of scattering my points into a grid, I want to scatter them into a box, which again, I'll set to be between 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. So it needs its center at a half, a half and a half. And I'm going to use an ISO offset to turn this box into a really coarse, quick volume with 40 sampling divisions. Doesn't matter for this case because I'm just using it to scatter points into that box. Like so, let's re-enable our grid here. So I've got this point filled box sitting here between 000 and 111. For this case, as I need a bit of point density, I need more points. So let's dial this up to maybe 150,000, like so. Relaxing that many points takes a good time, so you might be tempted to switch over relax its rations as well. In my tests, it didn't make that much of a difference. So we could also just switch that off. Next, when we initialize the directions, we're currently initializing our directions to be in the Z and X plane, so they're not pointing up or down. Let's fix that by heading into our initial directions node here and allowing for the Y component of our vector to be between minus one and one as well. Now, if we want to extend this to 3D, not only do we need the ability to sense values in our grid, which now is a volume, left and right of a particle, but also up and down of the particle. And the particle itself needs the ability to turn not only left or right, but also up and down. So we need a few additional matrices, which we're going to initialize here. So let's copy those two lines where we create the sensor matrices and add one for up and one for down. Do the same thing for our turn left and right and add matrices for turning up and turning down. So we initialized those matrices. Let's create those rotation matrices from them. Again, copying these two lines here for the rotation. That means for the sensor's rotation. So we want to rotate a sensor up around the sensor angle, but this time not around the Y axis. So again, our direction, our heading is pointing in the Z axis. And to turn that up or down, we need to rotate it not around Y, but around X. Do the same thing for the down, just with a negative sign in front of the sensor angle. Let's copy the two lines for the turn matrices as well. Call one turn. U for up and one turn D for down. And again, we want to rotate around the X axis, not the Y axis. And finally, let's write those out as a detail attribute. Sensor U equals to sensor U and sensor D equals to sensor D. And likewise, let's do the same thing for the turns. Turn U equals turn U and turn D equals turn D like this. Middle mouse on this. And yes, we just created our eight matrices. For the volume, the volume in this case needs to be 3D as well. So we uncheck two dimensional and we can see this three dimensional volume now, which is filled with the same noise we generated. We merge both streams, that's fine. And we need to adapt our solver. So in here, luckily we already took care of writing a three dimensional wrapping function up here. So that checks for the Y as well as the X and Z. And I'm just gonna hit Alt and E to open up an external editor to make this a bit more readable to have a bit more screen estate when going through this. So I need to load in a few more rotation matrices up here. So not only left and right for the rotation, but also up and down. Let's do that. Likewise for the turn matrices. Hit apply. So yeah, that went through. We need to create a few more sensor positions here, not only left and right of our center, but also up and down. And we need to wrap those as well making sure they don't overshoot our volume boundaries. We of course need to read in two additional values. So after we read in the right sensor, let's just copy this, paste it two more times, call one up sensor, one down sensor, using the up and down position. Now we are seeing not only three, but five values in our array here. So we need to check not only if we need to turn left or right, but also if we need to turn up or down. Like this. Hit apply and accept and that should be it for the 3D case. So the lesson here is if you know where you're going with this code, and believe me, when I first tried out the setup, I had no clue where I was going with this code. This is like the third or fourth iteration of the setup. But if you've got a good idea where you're going with your code, you can structure your code in a way that makes it really easy to adapt for other cases. For example, adding a third dimension to this one was not that difficult. He said before he tried out his setup, so let's just keep our fingers crossed, save that, head up one level, highlight our volume visualization node here, and well, hit play. And that clearly did not work. Okay, let's diagnose it. In this case, I think I just had the decay factor dialed in way too high. So with a factor of one or maybe 0 0.9, 
yeah, we're seeing more what we expect. Also, this thing, I think, needs a bit more particles. So in the scatter, let's set this one to 250,000 instead. Also, let's, in our volume visualization, dial in this density ramp bit. So we're capping off these low values here and maybe increase the high values a bit, as well as increasing the density scale so we can see a bit. Let's save this and simulate it. Yeah, and we're seeing a three-dimensional version of this fungal growth. However, as you might have noticed, this is quite slow. So I sped up the playback of the last part where I simulated this. This is down to one to two FPS maybe on my machine. And this is a really coarse volume. So with the addition of a third dimension, our computation times went up. That's why I emphasized how this setup is kind of dependent on quick hackish techniques too. Well, to be able to simulate this at least decently fast. Yeah, but that's the basic setup. If you read through Sage Jensen's blog post as well as watch his Instagram, it's amazing what he's able to pull off and pull out of this kind of setup. And he goes on how he augmented the setup by a few other behaviors, which are absolutely doable and which might be a nice exercise to see if you can pull that off. At this point, I wanna say kudos to people like Sage Jensen, like Jake Rice, all those massively talented, genius procedural artists. Their work is so inspiring and so awesome. It's one of the main factors that keeps me going with procedural design and generative design. Also, I want to mention it's really good to be back. I personally have been missing the free stream as well. So glad we restarted this. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without the help of our patrons, especially Rafik Anadol, Chris Hebert, Nick Nick, Joseph Howerton, Important Looking Pirates, Encore VFX, and NetherRealm Studios. Thanks so much, guys. And with that, until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.